heard our first plenary talk by uh, Jonathan Partington from Leeds University. He's going to talk about the decomposition of analytic function spaces with application. Please, Jonathan. Okay, thank you, Javad. Thank you for uh, and the other organizers for setting up this program and for inviting me to talk. Um, it's clear that a lot of interesting things are going to be happening over the next six months. I can't promise to go to every single lecture, but I will certainly be dipping in, in and out um, as time goes on. So today is the Richelieu week, and I will be talking about a class of space which includes the Richelieu space, so we can think about that as the main example, and I'll be concentrating specifically on those, though um, other spaces will uh, also turn up. So um, just to say before we start that uh, it's based on a total of three papers, um, joint work with Ava Guiardo and uh, also Isabel Schallander, Daniel Secco, and I'll give some references at the end of the talk so you can see what happens. Okay, so I'm starting very gently. Um, there'll be a bit of overlap with uh, Tom Ransford's course, at least the beginning. So the notation I'm going to use is for real numbers alpha. We'll write A alpha for the, um, it's going to be a Hilbert space, in fact, of analytic functions in the unit disk, which uh, have power series development, some of an z to the n, and the condition for being in the space and the norm, if you like, is given by taking the sum of power of n plus one to the alpha uh, mod an squared, and that's got to converge. So last week was Hardy week, and you'd have taken alpha equals zero. This week is Dirichlet week, and we're thinking about alpha being one. And uh, next week, I guess, is Bergman week, when uh, minus one would be an example. So um, you can also represent these things. Um, there's an integral representation where you integrate over the uh, unit disk. Um, I won't uh, use this, but I'll just mention this it exists. And um, uh, in particular for the Dirichlet space, the one we actually uh, thinking about most at the moment, uh, you'd actually be able to just take the, the standard Dirichlet integral um, of the uh, square of the derivative, absolute value, uh, with respect to the Lebesgue measure, DA. Okay, this will be relevant later on, but, but um, the exact formula is not particularly relevant. Now, surprising as it may seem, we'll be talking, the hero today is the, uh, the finite Blaschke product. And although this has a much more fundamental role in Hardy spaces than you might say in Dirichlet spaces, it will actually turn out to be the key to what I'm gonna be talking about. So what we'll do is we'll just set up the definition, um, take a set of points in the disk, no need to be distinct, and we'll form this product, B of Z, the product of Z minus ZJ over one minus ZJ bar times Z. And that's a uh, finite Blaschke product. You can, if you want, put a constant of modulus one outside it as well. I don't uh, care too much. We don't actually need that in any particular circumstances. So uh, it's not too hard to see that it maps the circle to the circle. And therefore, you can deduce from that quite quickly by the maximum principle, it's going to map the disk into the disk. And uh, it's, so it's unimodular on the unit circle. And we're still approaching Dirichlet spaces sort of by the back door, because I'm going via properties of Hardy spaces. And the space I'm going to work with is actually not the Dirichlet version of this, but the Hardy version of this. So I take um, the Hardy space H2. The subspace BH2 is closed. It's uh, an invariant subspace for the shift. That's um, part of Berling's theorem. And uh, we call these guys the model spaces, the complements of H2 um, minus BH2. This is actually, for a finite Blaschke product, this is just an n-dimensional space. The functions are all rational. Um, and like all model spaces, it's actually invariant under the adjoint of the Hardy space shift, which is the, the backward shift. So that'll be a standard notation that KB is a finite dimensional subspace of rational functions. It lies in all these classes. The poles are 
outside the, the disk. And um, B is always going to be a finite bash product. What I'm going to say won't, won't work for infinite bash products. So uh, trying to get the next page. That's it. OK, well, let's start. Let's keep working with H2. We'll, we'll gradually ease ourselves into Dirichlet space. Um, it's not too hard to check that uh, there's nice orthogonal decomposition of H2 in terms of, well, the first summand is the model space. Um, this is orthogonal to BKB, which is the Blaschka product multiplying the model space. That will also be n-dimensional. And then those two are orthogonal to B squared KB and so on. And this is an infinite decomposition. Uh, and in the Hardy space norm, it's, it's orthogonal. Uh, I just want to set up a notation here as well, which is that we'll use TB, the triplets operator, if you like. It's just multiplication by B. And on the Hardy space, this is an isometry. It preserves the norm. Now, um, making this a bit more explicit, let's note that we can therefore write each function f in the Hardy space as a sort of power series with um, the power series in B in this Blaschka product. I take the HRs to be in K of B in the model space. And F is an infinite sum. It's converging in the, in the norm of the Hardy space. And the norm of F squared is because of this sort of orthogonality. It's just the sum of the squares of the uh, norms of the HRs. And You'll recognize this in one very trivial case, which is if I take BZ to be Z, that is a finite Blaschka product. Uh, the model space is the complement of ZH2 in H2. That's just the complex numbers. It's one dimensional. So the HRs are actually constants. And what you're getting out from this decomposition halfway up the page is you're just getting the power series decomposition. And so that's very familiar indeed. Now, what was less obvious is that you can get a similar decomposition if you work in A alpha. So if you work in these um, weighted spaces, so including the Dirichlet space and the Bergman space in particular, um, it's the same notation, but it means something different because we're now working in a different norm. Uh, and also, it's not going to be an orthogonal decomposition um, in general. I mean, for powers B being a power of Z or something, it would be, but in general, it's not going to be. And we still get the same decomposition. In fact, the, the meat of this is that F is in A alpha, if and only if you can write it as the same formula, sum of HR, B to the R, the HRs we take in KB, this finite dimensional model space consisting of rational functions. And the condition for being in A alpha is now you put the sum of R plus one to the power alpha into your coefficients. So this again looks very much like what we saw an hour ago in the Dirichlet space. If I took B to be Z and you wanted to be in the Dirichlet space, then you'd write it as the sum of HR Z to the R and the, the sum of the R plus one to the alphas um, times the absolute values, the HRs, which would be constants, would have to converge. Um, we can also mention that, in fact, we don't have to be taking the Hardy space norm here on KB. Provided we make up our mind what our favorite norm is, and it could easily well be the, um, the A alpha norm, uh, all the norms are equivalent. It's just a finite dimensional space. And so we'll have the same uh, formula for a condition for being in A alpha. Uh, I should point out that, um, well, um, no, I don't think there's anything to point out there. I'll leave, I'll leave that for the moment. There's another aspect of this, but I'll leave it to later. OK, so let's uh, see what we can do with this. The idea of this is that. Um, we're going to get applications. I'm actually going to show you three different applications of this decomposition. And so let's uh, say a little bit more about it. Uh, we've said that you 
you're in a alpha, it's the same as saying you're this power series decomposition, the powers of B, uh, with this thing here. And in fact, we have more than this, we actually have a normal equivalence that uh, up to, well, it depends what norm you take on KB, but basically the, the norm of the function F, which you're decomposing, is up to a constant equivalent to the norm, uh, well, everything's squared here, but the norm of this, uh, this series here. And uh, as I say, the, the constants of equivalence will obviously change if you take a different norm on KB, but that doesn't matter. We're not actually worrying too much about this. Well, let's say a little bit about where this came up. Um, we hadn't seen it before, and we were doing some stuff on uh, weighted composition operators on Dirichlet spaces, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, then later on, um, this was done just for Bergman and Dirichlet space. Later on, we noticed, in fact, that you could do it for a wider range of spaces. And in fact, it's true for all the A alphas. And the proof is basically the same in all these cases. Uh, it uses two fundamental facts which hold in all these things. First of all, that the composition operator is a bounded operator on these spaces. Um, this um, composition operator is automatically bounded on the Hardy space. They're not automatically bounded on other spaces, but um, in this, with the finite Blaschka product, there's no problem. And likewise, multiplying by a Tirpitz operator, using a Tirpitz operator multiplied by B is also a bounded operation on, on A alpha. And you might, if you want a little exercise to do sometime, uh, see how you'd prove these two facts just using, well, don't use it, do it from, try to do it from a series, which is a mess, but you can do it using the, the integral representation of A alpha. And it comes out fairly quickly. And once you've got that, um, it's not a great calculation to show that you get this infinite decomposition of A alpha. Okay, so we're, wait, we're ready for our first application. Um, so I'm going to talk about weighted composition operators. Uh, in some sense, the, I think the applications get better as we go along, which is only right because we're talking about more recent work. But this, I think, has some, some interest. So let's take a holomorphic function from a disk to itself. And I'll want another holomorphic function, u. And the operator I'm talking about is a weighted composition operator. You first of all, you compose f with, with phi. So that's still a space of functions, or still a function defined on the disk. And then you multiply it by u. And of course, you may not even end up in um, your a alpha again. These things are, don't always make sense. And um, one approach to analyzing this, there are several ways to think about it, is looking at multipliers. Now, I guess multipliers are going to come in lecture two or lecture three of Tom Ransford's course. Um, but I can say enough here just to um, give a taste of it, perhaps. What I'm going to do, in fact, is, OK, I fix my alpha. So probably alpha is one today because we're in Dirichlet mood. And we're going to look at all the functions in U which give you a weighted composition operator, which is bounded on A alpha. So you fix the phi and you look for, for multipliers u. And um, it's known for H2, H2 is always easier than the other spaces, that uh, in fact, the multipliers of phi always include H infinity. Well, that's because uh, the composition operator without the u is a bounded operator on Hardy space and then multiplying by an H infinity function is a bounded thing to do as well. And it can be as small as that. And in fact, it's as small as that, if and only if phi is a finite Blaschka product. And I think the first proof of that is due to Contreras and hernandez Diaz, um, but there have been other proofs as well by different methods. So um, that's the, some of the story for the Hardy space. Let's talk about the Dirichlet space. Um, with the aid of the decomposition we proved, um, you can prove a similar result for the Dirichlet space. Now I'm going to talk about the full multiplier space. So I'm talking about all the operators, all the analytic functions u on the disk, 
such that multiplication by u, the Tirpitz operator, if you like, is a bounded operator. So that would actually correspond, if you like, in the previous slide to just taking uh, phi to be the identity function, phi z equals z, and seeing what you get from that. And a few basic properties that if you're in the multiplier space, you must be in the Dirichlet space and you must be a bounded function. And um, if the composition operator is itself bounded, then the multiplication by uh, d will, if, if d is a multiplier, then this uh, weighted composition orbit will also be bounded. So the multiplier space of phi will contain the, the multipliers on d. That I think is a wrong font m, but I too late to do much about that now. It's an m. Um, let's just notice that uh, the, there is a result you can prove here, which is very similar to the, the previous one. Let phi be an inner function. Then in fact, um, what happens is if phi is not a finite Blasio product, then you're not getting um, many multipliers because the composition operator itself is unbounded. But if phi is a finite Blasio product, you get um, the multiplier space of phi is the same as the multiplier space of the whole Dirichlet space. Um, however, you can find other functions of phi with norm phi infinity equals one. So their um, supremum norm is one on the disk for which the, the multiplier space is large. Um, I'll mention this um, just to fill in the time a bit, uh, but also because uh, it complements the previous result, that um, at the other extreme, we have the following results, which doesn't use a decomposition. Um, the multiplier space of phi could be as small as the Dirichlet space. And that will happen if and only if, in fact, um, phi is a multiplier of the Dirichlet space and it's of norm at most one, it's bounded function strictly less than one. And I won't go into the applications beyond that because they get more technical. And besides, I want to talk about less technical things, um, other applications. But I'll just say that in that paper of 2015, we went on to look at the spectral properties of weighted composition operators. And um, so that was all part of that particular story. OK, I'm. Um, quite a long way ahead of myself on time. I think I need to slow down a bit. Let's, um, I don't actually see the chat where I've got here. Is there any questions anybody wants to ask at that stage before I go, go on? No? Okay, let's, let's move on. Well, I want to talk about the second application, which is all to do with invariant subspaces and, and wandering subspaces. So, um, Often, you know, it's a big question in Hilbert space theory, the invariant subspace problem. And related to that is the general problem of trying to classify the invariant subspaces of a particular given operator on a particular given Hilbert space. And one approach to that is, um, is the following. What we do is we suppose we have an invariant subspace for operator T. Uh, T, in fact, in the next few slides will actually be um, a multiplication operator by a Blasio product. But um, at the moment, it can be any operator T. And we'll say the space has a wandering subspace property if M is generated under T by the complement of TM in M. So TM is um, a subspace of M, if it's M's invariant subspace. And um, OK, could conceivably not be closed, but we'll um, take the complement of it, complement of its closure, if you like. And what we try to do, what we mean by generate under T is we mean we take all the vectors in this complementary subspace and we hit them with powers of T and we take the closed linear span of everything we see. So that um, in particular, if you took Berling's theorem for the Hardy space, then um, M could be a theta h2, where theta is an inner function. Um, I'm taking t to be the shift operator. So tm would be z theta h2. And what's the complement of that is one dimensional. It's just generated by the function theta, by the inner function. And that does indeed 
um, generate if you take theta and theta z and theta z squared and so forth, that does give you the whole of, the whole of m again. So this wandering subspace property um, is what's interest, interesting us now. And we'll use a notation. Um, we we'll take m minus tm, that's the subspace we're talking about. And I'll stick it in some fancy square brackets with a t there to indicate that we're generating something with the help of um, the operator t. Now, if you've got a shift, a pure isometry on a Hilbert space, then you have a world decomposition, um, a bit like our decomposition in terms of KBs and BKBs and so forth. And those operators do have this uh, uh, wandering subspace property. However, if you go on to general multiplication operators, even on the Hardy space H2, um, it's not known exactly which operators do have this property. So it's still fairly easy to state unsolved questions there. Well, okay, now let's look at non-isometries. So let's go back to our other A alphas and Richelieu fans will be wanting to take alpha equals one again. And the situation is far more complicated. And the problem is that you can't even get a hold of what these invariant subspaces are um, in a sort of nice, clean way that you can work with. However, some great guys have done some good work on this. And Alman Richter and Sundberg and Shimorin, and I'll talk about this uh, on a future slide, say that if you do take the standard shift, just multiplying by z, then on the range of subspaces between Bergman and Dirichlet, so Bergman, Hardy, Dirichlet, and things in between, you do get the wandering subspace property. However, um, make it more than z, make it z squared, and you're already in deep water, and nobody quite knows what's happening there. And the answer can't be the beautiful answer that it always works, because um, Daniel Secco found um, an alpha and a k which this wandering subspace property fails if you do multiplication by z to the k on a alpha. And um, okay, his example is sort of quite a long way outside the range we're talking about now. You've got alpha equals minus 16. So that's a sort of very huge Bergman type space. And you're taking k equals six. That's an explicit um, choice of numbers. He's got a range of numbers for which things work. That's um, an example. So um, there are lots of difficult things going on here. Let's um, just uh, see what Shimoin said here, because he has some nice results which we can use in this. Um, let's suppose the condition that we're taking an operator such as the inter intersection of all the t to the nh's is, is just zero. So what I'm doing here is I'm for example, if I'm taking the shift or shift multiplying by z to the six, uh, t to the n means I'm multiplying by z to the six n. So your power series has got a huge number of zeros in front of it. And so the intersection certainly will be zero. And so let's suppose this is a, an assumption. And we'll suppose two things, two inequalities, where you only have to suppose one of them. Uh, the first one is what is commonly called concavity. So that says that the norm of t squared x squared plus norm of x squared is at most twice the norm of tx squared. Um, that's sort of easy to figure out and why the word concave might come into all this, but I, I, I won't say more. Um, the other one's a bit more peculiar, but it's an inequality for x plus ty all squared and it's the most twice the norm of tx squared plus the norm of y squared. And so the first condition is one that holds just for one vector, well, it holds all the vectors in the space. Um, the second condition involves pairs of vectors. It's got to hold for all pairs of vectors in the space. And so by some very clever calculations, T managed, uh, Shimorian managed to show that T does have the wandering subspace property. Um, in particular, if you take alpha between naught and one, and you that includes our friend the Dirichlet space, and 
you just take the standard shift multiplying by z, then in fact it does have the concavity property, not too hard to check, and um, therefore you do have the wandering subspace property. And a bit more difficult is the other range between Bergman and Hardy. Uh, what you can do there is you can check with condition two, which doesn't have any fancy name, unfortunately, Chimorian second property. Um, that holds, and so you do get the wandering subspace property. So we've actually, because of this, we've got it all the way between minus one and one, all the, all the range between Hardy and Berg, uh, between Bergman and Andrichle. Now, what I want to do is I want to um, play around the equivalent rules. Um, the pro problem is working with a standard inner product is, well, it's obviously very convenient in some contexts. In the context I want to talk about, where you're multiplying by a finite Blaschka product, um, it doesn't really fit in very nicely with the, this. It does in the Hardy space case, but not in, in the other alphas. And I'm going to restrict myself to alpha between minus one and one. And I'm going to say, well, in fact, what happens is you can choose an equivalent norm, which depends on the Blaschka product, and you can write it down explicitly. And under that um, equivalent norm, this equivalent Hilbert space norm, TB has the wandering subspace property. So that um, if I'm taking uh, TB of M for an invariant subspace for TB, then its complement in M uh, with using that and the Blaschka product. So again, I take all the vectors in this complement and I take B of them and B squared of them and so forth. And take the closed linear span of everything I, I find, that gets you back M again. Um, it should be pointed out that, I mean, okay, in the Hardy space case, M minus T B of M is one dimensional. Uh, if, sorry, is for the multiplication by Z, it's one dimensional. Here we're more, more likely to be working with um, spaces uh, which are multidimensional. In fact, in things like the Bergman space, you can start getting infinite dimensions and so forth. So um, this is not sort of quite as friendly as it looks, but it does give you some handle on what these invariant subspaces might be. And if you're talking about multiplication by Z to the K, for which the um, decomposition I wrote down actually does turn out to be orthogonal, um, in spaces apart from just the Hardy space. If you take alpha between naught and log two over log k plus one, then the norm you get can coincides with the no usual norm on alpha. So you can write it down and uh, um, you sometimes do get the norm you started with. Most likely you won't. However, if I take k to be one and I take um, alpha to be one, which just gets into this range, I'm back to the shift on the Dirichlet space. So I'm seeing something which we saw already. We, we're seeing the fact that for the shift on the Dirichlet space, um, the subspaces are wandering, the invariant subspaces are wandering subspaces. Well, I'll say a little bit about a proof, not too much really. Um, obviously it uses a decomposition and we've seen already that um, there are norms which, have coincide, which correspond nicely to the decomposition because um, I might just skim back to decomposition. Um, basically, the thing at the bottom of this page uh, does give you a norm for which, which is equivalent to the original norm. That's not quite what you do, um, but it's, it's a start. You, you basically have to fiddle around with this a bit more, but you get a norm somehow resembling this. What you do actually is you, for the first few coordinates, you don't put in the weights, and then you put in the weights afterwards. There is a construction which does this. And then what happens is that uh, TB now becomes unitarily equivalent to a shift acting on a vector valued A alpha. So A alpha with values in CN rather than just in the complex numbers. And then Shimorin's theorem um, will apply to that, so we're okay. Right, so this is my last topic. Um, it's the biggest one. And I'm going to be talking about commutants of multiplication operators. 
So what we do is we think of one of our spaces. Let's perhaps start nice and gently with the Hardy space. And again, a lot is known about the Hardy spaces and much less is known about the other scales of spaces, things like the Dirichlet space, the Bergman space. So if you go back 30 years or so, uh, Cowan, Thompson, Devons, Wong, Shields, Wallen, and a lot of other guys um, wrote a number of papers on this and the fairly complete results on the competent of a multiplier on H2. So remember, multiplier um, would be a function H infinity in this context because the, the functions which multiply H infinity into itself, H2 into itself, are the boundary functions. Um, more difficult is the Bergman space. Um, some of the papers I know about are Douglas, Sun, Jane, Kukovic, and recently Abkar Kaoju. And they were mostly concerned with multiplication by z to the k. You can see somehow z to the k is the next thing you try once you've been playing around with z. And once again, what we do is we go back to our decomposition and see what it can tell us. So I'm going to rewrite the decomposition theorem in a, in a way which is a little bit more friendly uh, as regards the problem I'm trying to, to solve, this thing about competence of multipliers. So um, let's B be a finite Blaschke product. The model space is n-dimensional if it's, if it's a degree, degree n product. So I'll write out u1 up to un as a basis for that. Um, you could, for example, just take reproducing kernels based at the, the zeros if they've got distinct zeros, or you could do things involving derivatives if you've got repeated zeros. But there are lots of ways you can get bases for this space. It won't actually matter what you take. Um, so now what happens is that you can rewrite this um, in terms of saying that a function f in a alpha can be written as the sum of uj fj composed with b, or fj of b if you like, where the uj's are our basis for the model space and the fj's are just arbitrary functions in A alpha. And the nice thing is um, that the norm of F, I perhaps should have had a subscript alpha in here, but it's the same norm all the way through. The norm of F alpha here is equivalent to the sum of the squares of these um, Fj, Fj squares to the half. Um, I was hoping to do the example. The example comes later, so maybe I'll have to Perhaps I'll just say the example and perhaps have a slide about it later on. If you took, for example, um, b of z to be z squared, then what you would do is you take 1 and z, perhaps to be a basis for the model space. That would do nicely. And what you'd be getting is you'd be getting all the functions with just even coefficients. Um, and because fj of b would be fj of z squared. And so there'd be two terms in this sum. One term would be the even powers of, of z, and the other term would be the odd powers of z. So that's it's pretty clear what's going on for uh, b of z equals z squared. Indeed, for b of z equals just a power of z, z to the n would have n terms. And in that case, the result is pretty obvious. But the nice thing is it does actually work for general Blaschke products. Now, the competent theorem is as follows. Using that notation, um, a bounded linear operator on W on A alpha commutes with T of B, multiplication by B. And what it does, it takes this function, the sum of UJ, FJ of Bs. It keeps the FJ of Bs, but it turns the UJs into any functions which are multipliers of A alpha, so phi Js, I'm calling them. So, for example, let's go back to our z to the n. Um, if b of z was z to the n, then my uj's I would take as uh, 1, z, z squared, up to z to the n minus 1. The fj's of b's are just functions of z to the n. So my function is the sum of z to the k, fk of z to the n. And as Abkar Kawanju noted, this is what you get. Um, you get the sum of phi k. Phi k is a multipliers. If this is a Bergman space, there would be an h infinity or the Hardy space. 
if they were in the Dirichlet space, if we're in the Dirichlet space, obviously we get something more complicated. Um, but that identifies exactly what the, the multipliers are or what the commutant of the um, TB is. Um, from this, we can talk about reducing subspaces. Um, another big game in, in this story is trying to um, find reducing subspaces operators. I'll just remind you what they are. Um, one in a Hilbert space, a subspace is in a reducing subspace means it's invariant under T and invariant under T star, the adjoint. Or equivalently, it's saying that um, M and its orthogonal complement are both invariant under the operator T. Now, for example, if I was in the Hardy space and I did multiplication by Z, then the reducing subspaces are very limited. I only get the zero space and H2 itself because the space you get um, by Berling's theorem, the theta H2 spaces aren't invariant under the adjoint or their complement isn't invariant under the shift. You start getting more interesting things for higher powers of Z. So for example, I'm multiplying by Z squared, then the even powers give you reducing subspace and the odd powers give you reducing subspace. Um, another way of saying this definition is to say the orthogonal projection onto M is going to have to commute with both T and its, and its adjoint T star. And there's been a lot of work on this. The Bergman space seems to have been the main focus of interest. Um, and again, perhaps the main authors here are Douglas Putinar, Sun and Wang, and apologies to anybody else who has been missed out. Um, to attack this, I'm going to introduce a matrix notation. First of all, we can say the commutant of T of B um, is actually isomorphic to space of n by n matrices of multipliers. Because if we take a, a vector, a function, the sum of u, j, f, j of B, it's being mapped to the sum of phi k, f, k of B, say. The phi k's themselves have to be in A alpha. They are multipliers. So they multiply the function 1 into A alpha. Um, so what I've actually put here is a lie, but it's really a subspace of this space. But we'll, we'll see how it works out as we go on. Um, so the phi k's, you can also write using the, um, the uj's. So the phi k's, you can also write as uj phi j k of b. So what you've got is that w um, applied to a typical vector in A alpha, typical function in A alpha, sum of uj fj of b, gets turned into a double sum now, um, sum of uj phi j k of b fk of b. And this can be written much more elegantly in matrix notation. If I write the function in A alpha as a column vector, we've basically turned A alpha into A alpha to the power n by means of this Blaschka product. And what's happening is that the w is converting this column vector f1 up to fn into what you get <coughs> as multiplying that column vector by a matrix of multipliers. So that actually helps you find things like projections and commutant of TB. Um, we've mainly looked at Hardy and Bergman spaces. We haven't really looked at Dirichlet spaces on this. Um, and it's clear a lot more can be said than, than we managed to say, but uh, it, it seems to give a good technique. Well, I'm saying finally, and um, let's just see what we have to say about this. We have an orthogonal decomposition. We go back to our original decomposition. That was not orthogonal, in, except in special cases. If you took um, z to the n as your Blaschka product, then the decomposition using the, the model space stolen from H2 was going to be orthogonal. Um, let's try and do things directly in the Dirichlet space now. And the first observation is that if B is a degree n Blaschka product, like all the Blaschka products today in this talk, it's going to be finite dimensional, um, then every BK of D is actually a closed subspace. And we can therefore invent a decomposition. We first of all take K naught, which is the complement of 
BD in D. Then we take K1 to be the complement of B squared D in BD and so forth. And you keep going. So X naught, as I said, was D um, complement the image of multiplying by B. That's a, a Dirichlet model space, you might say. The XKs are taking the complement of BK plus one of D inside BK of D. Um, this has some advantages because it means that the multiplication by B is now a lower triangular, well, block lower triangular operator. Um, what it's clearly doing is it's taking K naught into BD, so it's taking it into later Ks. It's taking K1 into later Ks and so on. So it's lower triangular. And if you're looking for reducing subspaces and you want to look at self adjoint operators that commute with it, they will now have to be block diagonal, um, which does actually sort of rather simplify things a bit. So this sounds really wonderful. It sounds like we've solved all the problems you ever wanted to solve until you realize that, in fact, um, the difficulty is that the, it's very hard to get usable bases for these subspaces. Um, there's no trouble getting a, a usable basis for K naught. Um, as I say, you can do it in something involving reproducing kernels here if you want to, to reach those kernels. <coughs> um, it gets hard after that. And we were not able to find uh, a general formula for these things. So there are limitations to this technique. But um, again, some bright person watching this talk may, may see what to do next. OK, well, this is um, getting towards the end. Let me just say a little bit about the, the papers I've been talking about. The, the original paper with, with the weighted composition operators was in Math and Allen, um, six years ago now. As I say, there was something about boundedness of these operators, and it went on to discuss the spectral properties. And one of the tools used was this decomposition. Um, I'll leap down to the bottom one. I'm doing these things in chronological order rather than alphabetical order. Um, the work on the wandering property came out last year, integral equations and operator theory. And it was mainly concerned with trying to fill in gaps and try to extend things which were already known. And this technique of taking uh, equivalent norms, which at least ena enable you to, do, to get somewhere, because if I have a description of a subspace, the equivalent norm is, is well known in the sense that you can actually then compute its complements of the image and things. So it's, in some sense, it could be used in a practical application. Um, and then the final one was submitted a few months ago. It's uh, available on the archive. Um, and that's the one where, where we've called them weighted Bergman spaces. But in fact, we're talking about the A alphas here. Alpha going all the way from uh, minus one up to, uh, sorry, from minus infinity up to plus infinity. So not just the Dirichlet Bergman range, but into the unknown territory beyond. And uh, so there we were talking about these, uh, uh, how to characterize things like commutants and uh, what we could say about reducing subspaces as a result. So I'm afraid um, I've uh, robbed you of about 10 minutes of the talk. It's a bit, start, stopped a bit early here. Um, I don't know whether it's coffee time in Canada, it's probably tea time in England. <coughs> um, so I'll just say thank you very much and stop there. And of course, thank I'll answer you. questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Let's thank the speaker, of course. Uh, is there any question for Jonathan? If I stop sharing, I can see the chat, I guess. Yeah. Uh, much in the chat. Yeah. I, I do not see, I mean, there are close to 100, yeah, 134 participants. I don't, I do not see all. So if you have any question, please go ahead. Uh, Jonathan, my, myself, indeed, I have two questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, and well, you stopped sharing in the place you, you went over the wandering subspace. So I go uh, back to that and share again. That might be helpful. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, well, okay. yeah. Okay. I was in the right place, indeed. Mm. Uh, uh, um, the the one after when you have inequalities. Oh go, yes. Um, go forward, please. Con concavity in the other one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do not see the page. I ah, oh, here it is. The, the first question. Yeah. Uh, in, in the Rishle space, we have equality instead of less than or equal. And my question is that the coefficients two are they important? Can we replace them by by a constant c? Um, I don't have uh, Shimorian's paper in my head. Um, I think I think it does make a, a, a serious distance, a difference. Yes, I think it, that, I think the two is important. Two is important. And and uh, the, the second question is about the page after, uh, mm -hmm. when uh, you emphasize that there is an equivalent norm on, under which uh, you have the wandering property. Yeah. Why reaching to a different norm is important? Well, it isn't necessarily going to hold. We don't know. This is an unknown. We don't know whether it holds under the standard norm. We do for k equals one. Um, we certainly don't even for z to the k, for z squared or z cubed. And um, certainly we don't know for multiplying by a finite Blaschka product in general, whether you have the wandering subspace property. Oh. But if you've got a different inner product, which you can write down explicitly, that is at least something. Okay. Okay, it's not the answer to all your questions, but it's... So yeah, it's this is again another indication that the coefficients uh, to in second and third property, they are important. I think so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, what I find the most remarkable result in this talk is not my result, it's Daniel Secco's result, <laughs> that um, just by fiddling around, he managed to show that there are values of K and alpha for which you don't get the wandering subspace property. And that's really quite profound. And um, you can see the values these are not tight in any sense. These are just the values that uh, these techniques produce. It, it could quite easily happen that for alpha equals one and for k equals two, it didn't work. And that would be back in, our, in the Grishley space. We just don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. Any further question or comments for Jonathan? If the Burling theorem is known for this space? There isn't a Burling theorem as such. Uh, the, the description of the invariant subspaces in general, I mean, the Burling theorem just says that it's basically theta h2, where theta is an inner function. Um, if you're getting into other spaces, um, well, I'll probably be stealing Tom's thunder because he'll probably say something about this later in the week. But, um, for Burling, let's say just for the Bergman space, for example, the, the lattice of invariant subspaces of the shift is amazingly complicated. Um, in some sense, it's, it's a universal operator. And if you knew all the invariant subspaces for the Bergman shift explicitly, you'd be able to solve the invariant subspace problem. There's a notion of, uni of uh, universality of operators, and it's all connected with that. So that, um, relatively speaking, I mean, Burling proved a very important theorem, but there's no sort of nice version of Burling theorem for other spaces. The fact that you've got these wandering subspace properties is part of the story somehow. It's telling you a lot about the invariant subspaces. That they're generated by the complements of their images. But there isn't a Burling theorem as such. Jonathan, there is a question in the chat. Uh, I have to go out of sharing to see it, unfortunately. Oh, can I? I don't know. And I'll just. I can read it for you. Uh, can we characterize elements of the algebra of multipliers of the Dirichlet space? How do we describe this algebra? Um, I think I would be stealing from Tom's talk if I said, yes, Tom's nodded his head on that. Um, <laughs> Tomorrow. Rather than me giving you a very hasty and slightly muddled answer, I think I'd rather wait for our lecturer to... Will it be tomorrow or Thursday, Tom? Tomorrow. 
Okay, if you can wait till tomorrow, well, tomorrow morning for you, tomorrow afternoon for me, um, then you'll get a proper proper description of that, or certainly a more complete description. Any further questions? Uh, one more. Do we see Steven A alpha have wandering subspace for mod alpha less than equal to one? Um, we don't know in general. No, we don't know in general. We know that with an equivalent norm, you can you can you can do it. With the original norm, um, in general, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Even for, even for Blaschka products of degree two. Even degree two. If not, let's thank Jonathan again. Yep. Thank you very much, Jonathan.